Hello everyone, this is Dr. M and welcome to my YouTube channel, My Tooth Study. I'm a trained oral and maxillofacial surgeon and I'm here to help you out solve the difficult concepts of the dentistry so that you can apply them in your clinical practice as well as will be helpful for you to solve the problems or the questions for which you have been preparing for your dental board exams. As you all know, we have already started with the, the subject of the orthodontics which has been discussed in the previous videos. And today we'll be starting up with a new subject that is pediatric dentistry. Today we'll start up with the development and the developmental disturbances of the teeth. But before starting with the video, don't forget to like, share and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And also don't forget to click, in, click on the bell icon so that you get an update whenever I upload a video. Also, if you want details or, or the detail of my video that is the slides or the detailed notes kindly click on the description box fill on the google form and a link will be provided for the payment it's a low cost involved lecture notes and whosoever is interested can contact the google form so let's get started for today now as we all know that the development of the tooth has various stages broadly it is classified into the bud stage the cap stage, the bell stage, and then the eruption. Coming on to the first stage, which is also known as the initiation. Now, initiation occurs at six weeks of the embryonic life. All primary teeth and permanent molars arise from the dental lamina. Permanent incisors, canines, and three molars arise from the primary predecessors. Failure of the initiation results in congenitally missing teeth. And excessive buds results in the supernumerary tooth formation. These last two points, that is the failure of the initiation that results in them gently missing and the excessive budding results in supernumerary are very important for the dental board exams. Then is the proliferation stage, which is also known as the cap stage, as you can see here clearly. Now in this, the peripheral cells of the cap form the inner and the outer enamel epithelium. The failure in the proliferation results in a congenitally missing teeth. Also, excessive proliferation results in a cyst, an odontome, or even a supernumerary tooth, depending upon the amount of the cell differentiation. Now, histodifferentiation and morphodifferentiation. The cells of the dental papilla differentiate into the odontoblasts. The cells of the inner epithelium differentiate into the ameloblasts. As you can see here, the odontoblasts as well as the ameloblasts. The failure in the histodifferentiation results in the structural abnormalities such as the amelogenesis imperfecta and dentiogenesis imperfecta during the stage. Also, failure in the morphodifferentiation results in the size and the shape abnormalities, for example, the pegylatrodes as well as the macrodontia. Then coming on to the acquisition, that is the ameloblast and the odontoboblast deposit in a layer-like matrix. <clears throat> Disturbance in the apposition results in the incomplete tissue formation. For example, an intrusive injury to a primary incisor may disrupt enamel apposition and result in an area of a enamel hypoplasia. Then coming on to the calcification. Now enamel is composed basically of 96% of the inorganic material and 4% of the organic material in water. Again, this percentage is very important for your dental work. And calcification begins at dental cusp tips and the incisal edges and proceeds cervically. Localized infection, trauma, and excessive systemic fluoride ingestion may cause hypocalcification. Now coming on to the calcification and the eruption of the dentition. Now let's talk about the approximate calcification starting time for the primary tooth. Again, these charts are very important and these need to be remembered for your dental board exams. Now first, the central incisor. Now its approximate time of calcification is 14 weeks in utero. Then comes the first molar, which is 15 weeks. The lateral incisor, which is 16 weeks. Then canine, which is 17 weeks. And the last of all, second molar is 18 weeks. Then the eruption time of the primary teeth. This was the calcification. 
Then for the eruption, the central incisors for and maxilla erupts in approximately 10 months, the lateral incisor in the 11 months, the canine in the 19 months, the first premolar in 16 months, and the second premolar in 29 months. For mandible, the central incisors are most commonly erupted in approximately six to eight months, lateral incisor in 13 months, the canine in 20 months, the first premolar in 16 months, and the second premolar in 27 months. Then coming on to the calcification time, starting for the permanent teeth. Again, first molars are the ones which are first to calcify at, that is at the girth. The central incisors for both maxilla and mandible is at three to four months. The lateral incisor for maxilla is 10 to 12 months and for mandible is three to four months. For canine, it is four to five months and for both maxilla and mandible. For first premolar, it is around about one and a half year. For second premolar, it is approximately two years. And for second molars as well, it is more, mostly two and a half years. The approximate calcification time generally starts, that is at birth, generally the first molars begin to calcify. In the first six months, the anterior teeth accept the maxillary laterals. Then 12 months is maxillary laterals, 18 months is first premolars, 24 months, second premolars, and uh, 13 months, second molars. So these months or the timelines are very important and must be remembered very carefully. Now the eruption time of these permanent teeth. Now, generally, the tooth is numbered as one to eight. Now, the tooth number one generally erupts for mandible at the age of six to seven years. Then, the lateral incisor, which erupts in mandible at seven to eight years. Then, the canine in nine to ten years. Then, the first premolar in ten to twelve years the second premolar in 11 to 12 years, the first molar in approximately six to seven years, similar to that of the central incisor, then the second molar in 11 to 13 years, and then the third molar in 17 to 21 years. Now, as you can see here, The eruption times for the primary teeth. As we all know, there's a sequence. Now for here, the sequence of the primary teeth is as A, B, C, D, C, E. The tooth number B, C, and D tend to erupt earlier in maxilla. A six-month variation in the time of eruption is considered generally normal. The calcification of the permanent teeth is important to know the calcification time of the permanent tooth if the practitioner sees a pattern of hypoplasia or the hypocalcification of the permanent teeth. The approximate time of the cause can be determined. This information can aid the dentist in counseling the patient in regard to the anticipated enamel defects. Also, the eruption of the permanent tooth which has been described here. The average numbers is known for eruption of the teeth typically, taking four to five years for most of the crowns to for the complete formation, except the first molars, which takes around three years, and cuspids, which takes around six years. Again, very important question for dental birds. This knowledge is very important in determining the timing of the the enamel hypoplasia secondary to the systemic disturbances. Now, it takes approximately 10 years from the start of the calcification to the root completion, except for the canines, which takes generally 13 years. Typically, the tooth erupts through the bone but then when the two thirds of the root has been formed. The teeth typically erupt through the gingiva with the three fourth of the root formed and the interval between the crown calcification and full interdigitation is approximately five years. 
the eruption of the root concretion is approximately three years for most. The sequence is generally six, one, two, four, five, three, and seven in maxilla, and six, one, two, three, four, five, and seven in mandible. Okay, there is a difference of the position of the canine in maxilla as well as in mandible. Then coming on to the developmental disturbances of the teeth. First is the supernumerary teeth. Generally, the male to female ratio is approximately 2 is to 1. It affects mostly the 3% of the population. Most common supernumerary teeth are mesiodents, mostly palatal. Now classified as supplemental or rudimentary, it can be conical, tuberculate or even molar shaped. Supernumerary teeth may block the normal eruption. In such cases, consideration should be given to early removal to prevent the impaction of the permanent tooth. Then genital absence generally has incidence of 1.5 to 10%, including the mothers. The most common congenitally missing tooth is the mandibular second femolar, followed by lateral incisor, and then followed by the maxillary second femolar. Again, a very important question. The treatment options for congenital absence of a premolar is commonly treated orthodontically if the patient would have normally required extraction treatment. In these cases, all the spaces are closed. If the patient has excellent occlusion, normal overbite and overjet, and minimal or no crowding, congenital absence may be treated prosthetically. Congenital absence of lateral incisor may be treated by placing the canine to the lateral incisor position and then performing restorative lateralization of the permanent canines. Alternatively, the canines may be placed in the normal position and lateral incisors are replaced aesthetically. Then are the anomalies depending upon the size. It can be macrodontia and microdontia. Microdontia is seen in ectodermal dysplasia, endo chondroectodermal dysplasia, hemifacial microsomia, and even Down syndrome. Another example of macrodontia is the pegular tooth. Macrodontia is seen in the facial hemihypertrophy and orodental syndrome. Then is the fusion. The fusion is the union of the two primary or the permanent teeth. More common in primary teeth fused teeth have two pulp chambers and two pulp canals. Almost always in the anterior teeth. In addition to determining the tooth structure, the key to determine the fusion is to count the erupted teeth. Because fusion ordinarily occurs between two teeth, there is one less discrete tooth identity or the entity than the normal. In other words, in the primary dentition, children have 10 discrete teeth entities per arch. In a patient with fusion, there are only nine entities. Now then gemination. Gemination is the division of a single tooth bud resulting in bifid crown. More common in the primary teeth. Geminated teeth have a single pulp chain. Because gemination occurs on a single tooth, there is a normal complement of the tooth nodes. Then the anomalies of the shape. That is dense evaginatus, an extra cusp called the talons cusp has enamel, dentine, and pulp. The care must be taken when undertaking any of the operative procedures. Then dense invaginatus or the dense in dentine, caused by the in in invagination of the inner enamel epithelium, termed as tooth within tooth, most common in permanent maxillary lateral incisor, if enamel and dentine are not formed correctly within the defect, direct communication from the oral environment with the pulp tissue can occur. The ideal treatment is preventive. A small restorative or the sealant may be placed to prevent the pulpal involvement. Then torodontism characterized by a vertically long pulp chain and short roots may be clinically significant if the pulp therapy is required or the during, during the exfoliation process. Dilaceration. Also, another condition where a bent or twisted tooth usually occurs as a result of intrusive or displacement injury to primary teeth. 
it was permanent anterior teeth developed lingual to the primary predecessor. Injuries to weak prim anterior primary teeth may also displace or bend the developing permanently. A dilaceration is also a consistent finding in congenital ichthyosis. The torodontism is characterized by a vertically long pulp chamber and a short shoot. May be clinically significant if pulp therapy is required or during the exfoliation process. Then the anomalies of the structure. First is the enamel hypoplasia, which also refers to quantity defects of the enamel. May be due to the environmental or the genetic factors. Environmental factors include the systemic diseases, the fevers, which may cause disruption in the developmental process, fluorosis, nutritional deficiencies, particularly vitamin A, C, and D, calcium, and phosphorus. Neurological defects such as the Stroch Weber syndrome, cleft lip, palate, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, diphthotic syndrome, lead poisoning, and even rubella. Genetic factors include amelogenesis imperfecta, which will be discussed in further topics. Enamel hypocalcification refers to the quality deficiencies of the enamel and may be due to the environment of the genetic factors. The enamel factors are same as that of the hypoplasia, and the genetic factors are the amelogenesis imperfecta hypocalcified type, which is the normal thickness of the enamel, but the pool decalcified fract and it fractures very easily. Amelogenesis imperfecta has an incidence of approximately 1 to 14,000. The effect is related to the enamel only and is dependent on the development stage of the enamel. There's a normal pulpal and root morphology. The treatment depends on the type and the severity. Severe cases, especially in terms of quality of the enamel to pass full coverage restoration veneers may be appropriate for hypermaturation and hypoplastic patients. Then is the dentinogenesis imperfecta, which is approximately 1 in 8,000. It occurs during the histodifferentiation stage. The pre-dentin matrix is defective, resulting in the amorphic atypical dentin formation. There is primary and permanent teeth which are affected Teeth become reddish brown or gray opalescent. The roots are slender. The pulp chambers and the canals appear small. Enamel chips away very easily. Teeth can become severely abraded. The treatment may include a full coverage crown or the permanent severe abrasion. Bonded veneers on the anterior teeth can be proved to be successful. Dentinal dysplasia occurs in both primary as well as in permanent teeth and this is classified as shields type 1, in which there is normal crown anatomy, color is closer to the normal, then the dentinogenesis imperfecta, it is short, pointed roots, absent bulk chambers, or primary as well as permanent teeth and multiple periapical radiodescences. Shield type 2, in which the primary teeth appear similar to the dentinogenesis imperfecta. Permanent teeth generally have normal color, pulp stones, just in tube shaped pulp chambers, and no periapical resources. Some other conditions which affect the dentine are the regional odontic dysplasia, vitamin D, resistant rickets, hypoparathyroidism, and pseudo hypoparathyroidism. So, this brings us to the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed the video. But don't forget to like, share and subscribe to this video and also click on the bell icon so that you get an update whenever I post a video. Again, I would like to remind if you require the detailed slides and the detailed notes of my lecture, then you can click on the description box. You can fill up the Google form. You will be provided via email the details for the payment, which is very low cost. And then the link would be provided and post that the lecture would be sent. So that's all for today. Thank you so much.